We'll be in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 tonight. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul at this point um, comes really to a, um, in this epistle at the church at Thessalonica, comes about to a second transition. This will be, the first transition was from between chapters 1 and chapter 2. And now he has another transition between chapters 2 and, and chapter 3. Uh, we know that he is talking to brethren when he says, finally, brethren, that he is coming to a close of this epistle. Now, some people joke and kid and say that Baptists are just like Paul because we say finally, and then sometimes we just keep going after the finally, and then we have a second finally in there. Uh, but that first division in chapter 1 was Paul reassuring them of their relationship and mutual encouragement that they find in one another and to, pre and to persevere during tribulations. When we got to the transition into the second chapter, in the second chapter, he was dealing really with the meat of his letter um, to a degree, dealing with their fear. Their fear that they had missed the return of Christ. And he wanted to reassure them that they had nothing to fear because uh, there were things that needed to take place before the return of Christ. But he didn't want them to be confused by his letter. He didn't want them being confused by uh, false teachers or uh, misunderstanding. But he wanted them to have confidence and assurance in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what would happen to those who would accept the, the Antichrist and what they would receive as a blessing in accepting Christ and being true children of God. And, and so now we come to this final chapter, uh, this transition here into the third chapter. And, and as, we, as we come to that, it brings us to, to, it's more practical in nature. It's taking truths that he's given them already and applying them to the text. He finally will close this chapter in dealing with something that you and I typically don't want to have to deal with, uh, which in essence, and it's not the only chapter that deals with it, uh, but just church discipline. Learning how to discipline those within the church that, that are in spiritual error and unrepentant. And, and so we come to this text, and we'll get into that uh, next week. But this week, uh, we want to we come to the idea of Paul uh, seeking support from them and prayer from them, and reminding them of the trust and faith that they can have in the Lord. And so we come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 5. And if you're there, say amen. It says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful. Who shall establish you and keep you from evil? He says, we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we are commanded. Or which we command you and the Lord direct your hearts in the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. And so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, and Father, we seek you and seek your truth. We, we ask, Father, that you would uh, guide, lead, and direct us tonight. We pray, Father, that you would uh, just absolutely give us a fresh reminder of being uh, faithful in prayer and a faithful of supporting one another and faithful in realizing that we can trust you, that when we can't trust anybody else, we can trust you, Father God. That, God, we can have an assurance in our relationship with you and comfort in that. And knowing, Father God, that you hear prayer and still answer them today. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And amen. So we come in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. We'll go back and reread those verses. Uh, but we find a request for prayer. We find a request for prayer. And there's two sources the Holy Spirit of God uses to guide, rebuke, encourage, and protect the saint. There's two really two sources that he uses. Uh, one is the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God. He uses the Word of God to, to rebuke us, to encourage us, to protect us, to, to guide us, to do all these things. Uh, but then we also realize the Holy Spirit uses prayer. Amen? Look, you can take my eyesight. You can take my ears. You can take my tongue. 
You can do all those things. And I, I may not be able to speak the Word of God. I may not be able to hear the Word of God. I may not be able to see the Word of God. But I can go into God in prayer at all times and in all places. Amen? And so we have to realize that we as Christians today, I believe many times are losing the importance of prayer and the power behind prayer. Many times when we have an area in our life suffer in our relationship with God, it may be that our prayer life is suffering. So my question tonight is, are we being sincere in our prayers to God? Are our prayers a now lay me down to sleep prayers? Are they prayers at mealtime? Are they just prayers at random during the day? Are they, are they the emergency prayers that we go to God when it's an emergency and we need him, but the rest of the time we leave him? Or, or do we have that spirit of prayer that Paul calls us to and he called the, the, church, the believers there at Thessalonica where he says pray without ceasing. And why does he say this? Because prayer and the word of God are the two most powerful weapons of defense and offense that the believer has. Amen? And we've got to be more equipped in prayer. We've got to be sincere in our prayer and realize God answers prayer. And so Paul comes to them and he says, Brothers, pray for us. Pray for us. He, he wants them to pray for them. Paul's prayer was twofold. His prayer request was really twofold. He, he wanted them to know that he prayed that the gospel would be honored. He wanted them to pray that the gospel would be honored and be glorified even as it is with you. He said, you, we've shared the gospel with you and it was honored. We shared the gospel with you and it was respected. We shared the gospel with you and you took it in and it went out like a wildfire. And he said, so we pray that wherever we go, and we want you to pray for us, that where we go, the gospel will be honored. But why? Why does he do that? Because he also wanted them to pray that the gospel would be received. May we may have free course. Brothers and sisters, if you go to somewhere and the gospel is respected, if you go somewhere and the word of God has, has some authority and has some power, even revered, even if they don't believe in God, they, they still, they may not have truly accepted God and yet they still have, they still want to be assured in the word of God and they have respect for that, brothers and sisters, they, they can receive it when they have respect for it. Amen? If they don't respect it, they're not going to receive it. But if somebody comes to you and they, they at least respect the Word of God, they may not understand it completely, they may not even believe it, all of it, but they, they have respect for it, then they're more open to receive it. And he says, you honored the Word of God, you, you, you respected it, you received it, and when we did that, it had free course to go everywhere. And he says, so I want to have, I want you to pray for me and my missionary buddies, that the word of God would be respected and would go out like a wildfire. Are we still having that prayer today? Because brothers and sisters, the reality is there. We need to pray that the word of God is respected more now than probably we ever have. Because it's not respected anymore. I mean, it is blasphemy. God's name is blasphemed on regular TV, not the movies where it just these to be the movies and it just was an occasional movie. No, we're talking about continuously. On primetime television, the Lord is blasphemed. Uh, when, I will never forget, never forget when, when The Simpsons first came out, we watched it religiously in my house. I mean, if The Simpsons were on, we watched it. Everything was good. It, was, it had a lot of good teachable moments in it. It had some good lessons, believe it or not. And then one night, and I'll never forget the night, one night, they threw a story up there about Moses and the Ten Commandments. Blasphemed God. And blasphemed His Word. And we as a family said, I don't think so. And we turned it off. We were going to deal with that. 
That was shock and awe when the Simpsons first did that. Now, no matter what you put on, at some point, it's the LGBT movement. At some point, it's, it, it's, it's blaspheming God. At some point, it's laughing at the Word of God. And we have a society of young people and teenagers and kids and even young pucks that, that, that are being raised up to be, to be um, to a better, better word, just in, insensitive to it. Where you and I still have a sensitivity to it, they're getting numb to these things. And brothers and sisters, we have to pray that the Word of God would find, would find its way being Honored and glorified once again. There's only one thing that God put above the name of Jesus. And that's his word. Only one thing, his word. Brothers and sisters, this word is to be revered. It's not that we worship the word of God. We worship Jesus. But this is the heart of God that speaks to us. And Jesus was the incarnation. It was the word of God in the flesh and being lived out among us. Amen. And so we've got to pray that people would begin to revere God. Pray they would begin to revere his word, the gospel, so that in some way it will be received. It will be received. He prayed for the gospel to be honored because if it's honored, it would be received. When he stated, may it have free course, it was him saying, let the gospel run with haste. Run with haste. We must understand where the gospel is respect, respected, it will spread. And in the gospel, we find, our, we find ourselves blessing of salvation and an on position of child of God when we receive the word. Acts 13, 48 says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. How do people come to know the saving faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ? Through his word. Amen. Through his word. And Paul requested prayer for he and his missionary partners. His first prayer was for the gospel. That it would be respected. And that it would move with haste. And move freely. His second prayer was for he and his missionary journeys. He, pray, he prayed or requested a prayer of deliverance. That we may be delivered from the unreasonable... And wicked men. Reason, unreasonable in the Greek is defined as out of place or improper. Wicked is defined as degenerate and lewd. He knew that there would be people that would be against the word of God. He knew that there would be people that were against the teaching and the truth of the gospel. He knew firsthand how just how far they were willing to go in their dejection of the word of God. Remember, Paul was not always Paul. Paul was Saul of Tarsus. He, he was a wicked man, a vile man. He, he thought in the image of God and the whip in his ministry of God was to hunt down those of the way. He was the one that held the coat of those who were stoning Stephen and gave tribute to do it. And gave permission to do it. He was telling how many people he had imprisoned and murdered for the sake of his idea of what it was about. So he knew just how bad because he was there with him at one time. He also knew what it was like to be stoned and left dead. He knew what it was like to be tortured. He knew what it was like to be imprisoned. He knew all these things and so he knew just how far the enemy was willing to go. To keep the gospel from being spread. And so with this insight and with this mind, he said, pray that God delivers us from that. Because we're dealing with some wicked people, amen. We're dealing with this whole BLM thing. It's not a political thing. 
It's not a white and black issue. It's not a majority minority issue. It is a spiritual issue. It's spiritual. Brothers and sisters, we live in a time and an age where the enemy is on attack left and right. And our weaponry is not carnal. Do we understand that tonight? But our weapons are of God and they're spiritual and they're mighty to take down souls. And so Paul is asking for physical protection. But he's also praying for spiritual protection. Are we praying the same for each other tonight? That we are protected from the spiritual warfare that each and every one of us are in. When we, when we gave our life to Christ, we opened ourselves up to spiritual warfare and attack like never before. And I assure you, the enemy doesn't care that you're trying to live for Jesus. In fact, the enemy despises that. And the enemy is going to send whoever and whomever he wants to destroy you and your family. Because he gets no greater pleasure than seeing us fall and suffer. And Paul knew this. And so as he prays, he says, pray for deliverance. Because no matter how you state it, Paul was describing those who were contrary to the word, resisted the word, and vehemently persecuted those declaring the word. And he knew not everyone was of God and that many resisted the gospel. So for all men have not the faith. He says, every person, he said, not every person we deal with is a Christian. You know, it's amazing. I, 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 I can run up to somebody walking down the street, and I've done this before. I, I drove up to a kid one time, and I, I had to learn to change some things because everybody I was talking to was saying a prayer, but I'm not sure everybody I talked to got saved. But I would pull up beside somebody on the road and I'd jump out of my car and run at them. First off, I was, I'm 6'1", 6 6'2", 6 and way close to 400 pounds. And I've been this size for a minute. So I don't care who you are. If somebody my size pulls up beside you by self, walking down the road, and jumps out of a car, and starts making a V-line for you, you already nervous. Okay, I'm even nervous. I'm sitting back trying to look at a person in the face. What are they up to? And the first question out of my mouth was, do you want to die and go to hell? And they would look at me and they're like, no. And I'd have to, I'm not going to kill you. Whew, thank you, you know what? I said, do you want to die and go to hell? Well, no. If somebody asked you, all of you tonight, if you wanted to die and go to hell, how many would raise your hand? Not a one of you. Because nobody wants to go to hell, right? And if saying a prayer is going to get you out of hell, I'm saying a prayer. But how many times, how much of that prayer is genuine and sincere? Right? We're not going to teach easy believism. We're going to teach genuine confession and repentance in Jesus Christ. Because that's what salvation is. Not easy believism. But it is amazing. And you say, what does that have to do with this? Because do you know how many people I've talked to and asked them, do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Do you got a relationship with God? Well, yes. Everybody I talk to knows Jesus. Everybody I talk to is saved. Here recently, though, I'm finally getting to the point when I talk to somebody and I'll ask them, and they may say, well, yeah, I know Jesus. Really? Tell me about it. I've gotten to the point where I just ask them open-ended questions because, you know, the demons in hell believe in Jesus. And they cringe because of it. You can believe in Jesus and still not have a relationship with Jesus. Amen? 
You can believe in God and still not know God, not have a relationship with God. And I'm just naive enough to believe that not every person that stands in every service Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night is saved. And I have to approach everybody as if they're lost. Amen? And in particular in this text, he said not only are these people lost, they're vehement in their hatred toward God. I could give you a whole list of people in Congress right now that are vehement in their hatred for God and His truth give you a whole skew of people probably locally that some would say are vehement. But brothers and sisters, let me explain something to you. We live in an evil time. And it's just as evil, if not more evil, than it was during the time of Paul. And as time grows and it gets closer and closer to the return of Christ, it's going to get eviler and eviler. If that's even a word. More evil and more evil. And we have got to pray for the gospel that it would be respected and thus spread like a wildfire. And we have got to pray for one another that God protects us and protects us against the enemy, protects us against those that are anti-God and anti-truth. Because Paul knew just how wicked these resisting the gospel could be. And we also need to do another thing. He, he requested prayer out of conviction and the faithfulness of God. We need to pray with conviction. How many of us actually pray with conviction anymore? How many of us pray when we pray to God about something, we just go ahead and thank Him in advance knowing He's going to answer? And pray in faith. The first time that I heard somebody tell, ask me, do you just, when you pray, do you go ahead and thank God for the answer in the first end? I looked at him and I said, that's a concept. I never thought about that. Most people in the Baptist church don't. But praying in faith is just going to hell and telling God in the first place, thank you. I know it's going to answer. It may not even answer the way I want you to answer, but you're going to answer it. And I'm praying in faith, I'm expecting in faith, and I'm going to receive in faith, and so I'm going to go ahead and thank you in advance in faith. And Paul, when he was asking them to pray, his prayer and his faithfulness was in God. His faithfulness really wasn't even in the people that were praying. It was in God answering those prayers. Because he knew God was faithful. He says, and let us consider, and to Hebrews 10 and 24, it says, in, or not Hebrews 10 and 24, I got it wrong, but in Hebrews 10, it says that it tells us faithful is he who is promised, brothers and sisters. So as we pray, as we ask others to pray for us, let us realize our Lord is faithful. Amen? Our Lord is faithful in verse 3. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. The Lord shall establish you and keep you from evil. The Lord never fails to be faithful. I fail to be faithful. If you're honest with yourself, you fail to be faithful at times. I mean, that's just the reality of it. We're, we're finite. We're, we're, we're fallen people. We're fallen by nature. We are in the image of God, but we're a skewed image of God because we have sin in our life. We're broken, so not all the time are we faithful, but God is always faithful, but the Lord is faithful. And that's an ever-present statement. Amen? He never fails. And the Lord will willfully set fast and strengthen His people even in the midst of persecution. Who shall establish you? That word established in the Greek brings about the truth and the idea of setting fast and strengthening. He will set us fast. He will strengthen us. He's talking to a church that's persecuted. He's talking to a church who has been beat up and, and ridiculed and mocked and suffered daily. 
And he says, but understand the one I'm asking you to pray to, the one I'm trusting you to pray to, is faithful and he will set you up and establish you and give you strength even in the midst of your persecution because he's just that good. And that's the God we serve, amen? He's that faithful. And the Lord will faithfully guard his people even in the midst of persecution and temptation. And he says, and keep you from evil. He will help you resist it. He will help you through it. Why don't we trust God the way we're called to trust him? Why don't we trust God anymore? We say we trust God, but do we? We say we have faith in God, but do we? And I'm not getting you to question yourself. I really want us to answer this question tonight. Because it's a question that we really need to answer ourselves. Do we really trust Him the, say, the way we say we trust Him? Because if not, we need to ask God to help us get there. Amen? One of the scariest things that I ever did was resign at a church one time. I lived in a parsonage. It was the only income I had. It was the only income of Mary and I had. Mary had been praying for a year that I would leave. In hindsight, I probably should have left a year before I did. But I said, no, can't afford it. No, I, I, I got to take care of my family. You know, I had ventured out a few things. Nothing ever came of it. I said, you know, and through a Satan deal of events, I came home one Sunday night. I looked at Mary and I said, I quit. And she looked at me and she said, the ministry? Because she knew and she was there. And I said, no, I'm not quitting the ministry. I said, but I'm, I'm resigning from the church. And I'll never forget my, my wife's words as I'm a husband telling my wife, we're fixing to lose the only income we got, the only house we got. I don't have a clue how we're going to make it, but I know this is what God wants. And my wife's response wasn't, have you lost your mind? It wasn't, uh, you think. It wasn't, you sure you about this? My wife's response was, amen. Thank you, God. And you've got this. She wasn't trusting me to take care of us. She was trusting God. For the next four months, God supernaturally provided until he put us where we should have been a year earlier. But he supernaturally took care of us when we needed a house sold and the house wasn't selling. The day we should have made our first, our, our first, the, the day we were supposed to make a house payment that we couldn't afford was the day that a, a couple in Houston had only seen the house once closed on it at a bank in Houston. A house sold. Just like that. Times where Mary and I didn't have medicine, didn't have the money for her medicine, and she's epileptic and she's got to have her medicine. Money, just like that. Times when we didn't have food or groceries, just like that. Brothers and sisters, we have a faithful, faithful God. And when I left that church, I felt that I was under immense persecution. I was beaten, battered, bruised, and bloody. Mary had almost committed suicide twice in that tenure. As a husband, I'm coming home to a wife that says, I don't want to go to church anymore. Charles, I'll never divorce you, but
But now I know why preachers' wives leave them. And twice I come home with a pottle of pills one day and a razor the next day. And she said, the only reason I didn't is because God showed me your face. I can, I can, I can sympathize with these believers at Thessalonica. My persecution wasn't coming from those who didn't know the Lord. My persecution was coming from those who claimed they did know the Lord. And yet in the midst of it all, God supplied and was faithful. Brothers and sisters, we have a faithful God. Each one of us could give our own stories of how God has supernaturally provided and protected and taken care of us. I give my stories not as a pat on my back because I just trusted God. Because I'm going to be honest with you, there were days in the midst of the desert that I didn't necessarily trust him. But I hold on to the truth that Timothy says that he is faithful even when we are unfaithful. That we serve a faithful God. And faith in the Lord's work is our last point tonight. Faith in the Lord's work in verse 4 and 5. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things we command you and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Paul's conviction about the believers at Thessalonica was in the Lord, not the people. He says, and we have confidence in the Lord touching you. We have confidence in the Lord that He's going to touch you and convict you to follow through with these prayer requests. These prayers that we're asking. But ultimately his confidence was in God pricking their heart to do so. He knew that, that God would interject. God would do that. When Paul was requesting prayer from his fellow believers, it was through his faith in the Lord that these requests were made. He had conviction that they would pray for him and his missionary partners that you both do and will do the things which we command you. But it goes back to the singular point that we have conviction in God that he'll touch you. When I ask somebody to pray for me, I'm praying that God will answer their prayers. I'm trusting that individual to pray for me as God reminds them to pray for me. Because there's times that we take prayer requests down and we can list them. I mean, we've got how many names on our prayer sheet? Now, unless you take that list out and look at it while you're praying, you're not going to remember all those names. But I assure you, as you're going throughout your days, you're going throughout, God may lay one of those names on your heart and you pray for them. I have literally, and this is not a joke, I don't remember the guy's name. I'm going to say his name was John Smith. I really don't remember the guy's name. I, I was sound asleep when it all happened. Mary tells me that I woke up in the middle of the night one night dead asleep. I, I, this was years ago. I was dead asleep. I sat up. Stood, sat, sat straight up in my bed and started praying for John Smith and whatever he was going through. Just as clearly as I'm talking to you right now. And I mean, I just went at it and at it and at it. And finally, I, after I said amen, I just went back out. Mary woke me up the next day. She said, Charles, who is so-and-so? I said, who? She goes, Charles, who is so-and-so? I said, Mary, who are you talking to? She goes, don't play with me, son. I said, Mary, I'm not playing with you. I don't even know what you're talking about. She goes, Charles, I promise you, you sat straight up in your sleep last night and started praying for this person. And when you got done praying, you said, amen, you went back out. And the next thing I know, you were snoring. I looked at her and I said, well, evidently God wanted somebody to pray for that man and nobody else, was away. Nobody else would do it. I'm telling you right now, when God lays somebody on your heart, you better pray for them. Amen? There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Pray for them. We often put more confidence. 
And man than we need when I request prayer from others as much as I love and trust others my faith ultimately is not in their praying for me as much as it is the Lord knowing he hears prayers and answers them and Paul was convicted that God was straightening fully their hearts Paul was, 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 was convicted that God would straighten fully their hearts. God would straighten their hearts down a path that would lead to a deeper love for God. Direct your hearts into the love of God. That word direct means to, to be a, a straightened path. And he says in the love of God. Brothers and sisters, you know how, overcame, how I was able to forgive those in my, that particular season of my ministry, I prayed for them every day, three and four times a day. Just prayed for them. I prayed for me too. I said, God, show them where they were wrong. Show me where I was wrong. Help me forgive them, God. Help me learn whatever it is that you want me to learn from this because I don't believe anything happens for just no reason at all. Help me see what I could do better. Teach me from this, but help me forgive them. It took me about a year to truly let go and forgive them. It took about a year. I finally didn't really have to until about a year ago. I forgave them, but there was still something there that, that I didn't know what it was. And about a year and a half, two years ago, I was in, up in the foothills doing a revival. And the one couple that I hadn't been able to talk to since everything went down showed up that night. And I was able to look at them face to face and tell them hi and let them, know, let them know I loved them in the Lord. And it was good to see them. And the one I was talking to was the not the one who was the main guy constructing it, but the second guy. And I was finally able to look at him and say, I love you and mean it. And why? Because through the years as I prayed for them and I prayed for others, my relationship and my love for God grew stronger. And in my love for God grew stronger, my love for his people grew even stronger. Brothers and sisters, when we go to God and we go to God in prayer and we trust God and know God and we continue to, to go back to God, God will straighten our hearts into a deeper love with him. And then God would straighten their hearts down a path that would lead to a foundation of perseverance into the patient waiting for Christ. He says, I trust God to do this for you. So I, I conclude this. I conclude with this. We will face trials and tribulations. It's part of life. We're going to face it. We will face uncertain days, but let us learn the power of prayer. Let us learn to have faith in the Lord. And let us learn to love the Lord and wait patiently upon his return, upon his return.